This is part two of subtopic 1.4 on chromatography. We're going to firstly talk about column chromatography because it has links into the other forms which you'll need to know about. Column chromatography is used to isolate components of a mixture. Uh, analysis or identification of those components can then follow. It uses a column that's very similar to a burette. So it's a vertical column that's going to be packed with a solid adsorbent uh, substance. Uh, that being our stationary phase. The mobile phase, which is called our eluent, is going to be constantly supplied, and this will just pass through our column by gravity. Here's a diagram showing you uh, a setup of column chromatography. So starting off, we've actually got our column here, which is packed with our stationary phase. Our mixture, to be separated, is going to be dissolved in the mobile phase, and then it's going to be injected at the top of our column here. We have to continuously add our mobile phase throughout this process so that it doesn't dry and it allows and encourages the separation of the components in the mixture. So as we keep doing that, the components will start to separate because of their differing attractions between the stationary phase and mobile phase. Eventually, we're going to get to this point where the components are going to be collected and we can use a test tube or a flask um, as it reaches the bottom of the column. Once we've collected this particular fraction, we can then go ahead and collect a different fraction in another test tube or another flask. Here's another diagram just to show you what's going on and what this just highlights are the interactions between the stationary and mobile phase. So we've got our loaded sample here, our stationary phase here, we add in our mobile phase and we allow that to just a loop through the column. We can see that out of this mixture of um, blue and red dye, the red dye actually has weaker interactions with the stationary phase. We can say it is less strongly adsorbed to it, whereas the blue dye itself is more strongly adsorbed. And so that means the red component is going to be eluted first. We can collect that followed by the blue component, which we can elute uh, secondly. The principles of column chromatography are going to look very similar to when we talk about gas chromatography. Gas chromatography can effectively separate gaseous mixtures and volatile mixtures. It is an extremely sensitive technique um, and it can detect very small quantities of different components in mixtures. A key thing about gas chromatography is that the components must not decompose when they are heated and vaporized. Some common applications involve blood alcohol analysis, analysis of urine samples from athletes for performance enhancing drugs, as well as drug detection in forensic science, as well as the other ones that I've mentioned down here as well. Here is a diagram of a gas chromatography setup. So we're going to start off with our thermostatic oven, which is in the middle here. And we say that the sample of interest is injected into one end of this coiled chromatography column, and it's housed in this thermostatic oven itself. This controls the amount of heat and it controls the temperature, and it ensures the mixture itself is converted to a gas if it isn't already one yet. The column itself is going to be packed with our stationary phase, whatever that is. We then allow a carrier gas, which is inert, so it's going to be a gas like hydrogen, helium, or neon, to flow through. And this inert carrier gas will help carry components of this vaporized sample through the column. The speed at which it does this depends on the interactions that the components have with the stationary phase in particular but to a degree also the mobile phase. So in other words, if there are strong interactions or stronger adsorption, it's actually going to take longer for it to pass through this column. The flow rate and the temperature can be adjusted to assist in this movement and transportation of component molecules. Eventually the components will be eluted or they will escape through, um, past the column and reach a detector which will determine the time at which a component exits the column and also helps us determine the relative proportion of it present. Here's an example of something that we might see 
This is what we call a gas chromatogram, and it shows us what we call retention times. So retention times, you have to keep in mind, are the times it requires for each of the components to exit the column and reach our detector. We can see that there are four peaks on our chromatogram here. Time increases from left to right. We can see that those components with the shorter time, the shorter retention time, are going to be those that are less strongly adsorbed to the stationary phase. Whereas these components here, which had a longer retention time, would have been more strongly adsorbed, so it took more time for them to pass through the column. An additional piece of information we can get is based on the size of the peaks themselves. So smaller peaks often indicate a lower concentration of that component in the mixture, whereas a larger peak will indicate a higher concentration. So let's come back to retention time. Retention time is defined as the time taken for a component to be eluted from or to pass through a column. Retention times are also going to be characteristic of the component with respect to whatever stationary and mobile phase that you use. If a substance has a shorter retention time, we can say it's less strongly adsorbed to the stationary phase and or it's more readily uh, dissolved or desorbed into the mobile phase. In contrast, longer retention times mean they are more strongly adsorbed to the stationary phase and less readily dissolved or desorbed in the mobile phase. Here is an example question, so we need to refer to the following chromatogram on the right. Part A, state the retention time of component E. And so to get the retention time, we look at the very top of that peak and we mark down, so I might do this here, we mark down on our graph until we hit the x-axis and we want to try and estimate as, as close as possible what that time is. From this chromatogram, I've suggested that the retention time is approximately 11.4 minutes. Part B, state the component with the shortest retention time. So keeping in mind time increases from left to right, so that would just be component A. Part C, if the stationary phase was polar, state the most polar component, and then you need to explain your answer. So the answer in this case is component A. F. The reason being is that component F has the longest retention time. This means it's formed the strongest interactions with the polar stationary phase, meaning obviously it's, it requires more time to loop from the column and as a result results in the longest retention time. Another technique is called high performance liquid chromatography or HPLC. It can also be referred to as high pressure liquid chromatography and it uses very similar principles to gas chromatography. Some differences include that the column is often much shorter and it utilizes smaller adsorbent particles as a stationary phase. We also use high pressure to force the solvent or the mobile phase through the column so this can happen much more quickly. Common applications do include analysis of foods for antioxidants, sugars, vitamins, and aflatoxins, which are um, human carcinogens from mold, the testing of pharmaceuticals, as well as polymer analysis and others. Here is a diagram of high-performance liquid chromatography. So very similar elements, but let's have a look at how this occurs. So we'll start off with our column here. So this is going to be packed with our stationary phase, which is a solid. We also have our mobile phase, which is our solvent here, being forced through the column with the addition of a pump to help drive that. So this is going to be flowing through the column, and then it's going to be collected as waste. Our sample is injected at this valve here. So the sample and the components will travel through until they get to the column. And this is where we start to get that separation of the components of that mixture. Uh, the components or the component that travels um, fastest through the column will reach our detector first and then we would have some type of readout, an electronic readout that will determine the retention times of each of the components. Over to the right we've got a smaller version of our column here. We've got three different coloured components we can see that the yellow component has actually travelled out the column first. So on our readout, we can see it has the earliest retention time, 
The red component is the second one, so it's in the process of being eluted. And then finally, the blue one will eventually be eluted from that column there.